Our culture has developed a habit of turning to our technological devices for navigation and for socializing, for problem solving and maintaining our relationships. This affects us from the highest level of our society to the most personal. Our politicians want to apply technological solutions to global conflict and we ask our devices the most intimate questions, expecting an answer. Yet we as a society regularly question the content that we receive from other sources of information. Our representatives raise questions about accountability in Parliament. Our newspapers tackle false claims. Our investigative journalists expose wrongdoings and corruption. And at school, we as individuals are taught to question our sources. So why should the online world be any different? Are the processes of persuasion so radically changed by a computer screen that we throw away our critical capacity and become techno-fundamentalists? Does the software warrant our blind acceptance of what were delivered, invisible risks and all, rather than thinking about how it could be different? In 1986, computer historian Melvin Kranzberg at the Georgia Institute of Technology published six laws of technology. His first reads, technology is neither good, nor is it bad, nor is it neutral. Technology can't be understood without seeing how it's linked to society. It's as much a cultural artifact as music or film, art, architecture, food, and comedy because it's produced by human beings in a particular time. You have particular interests particular backgrounds and particular tools at their disposal. It's possible to identify a Spielberg movie, a Gary building, a Warhol print, Mexican cuisine, a Beatles song, and for those who have the language, to see the signature of the designer of a technology. This information resource and great connector is also art. In cinema and theater, there's a term to describe what it is that the director keeps inside the frame of the camera or within the proscenium arch. Mise en scene, literally to put into the scene. It's shorthand for the control that a creator has over how a story is told. Adding or removing elements creates compelling storytelling, but it also begs the question, what's outside the frame? Computer software designers do this as well, but we don't yet recognize this as such. We're not as well versed in the lingo that they use to tell their stories about what it is that they wish to get across in their services. We can only take what they prescribe as relevant and valuable based upon their interpretation of the human condition. A technological system has biases that are built into it that we will most likely see in retrospect. A service that works now may not in future for reasons that may only become obvious after time has passed. This isn't a technological comment, but a cultural one. In 50 years, when we have the ability to observe Google or Facebook dispassionately and without our current biases and the filters that we view the world through, will they feel as dated and as incongruent as brute cologne or bell-bottom trousers? The way you think about the world and the value you give to ideas depends not only on the ideas themselves or the medium in which they were communicated to you, but also the social and the psychological context in which you received them. The idea that you received on a sunny Monday in front of a screen may affect you in a different way than if you first discovered the same idea on a rainy Thursday via a newspaper that was given to you by an enemy. That social and psychological context is, of course, unknowable by the designer of any machine, and so no machine would ever be able to fully account for it. Yet we often ignore this when we let it tell us what to think, what to share, and who to know. Services like search engines and social networks haven't cracked it, yet they are phenomenally successful. What is it in their magic that contributes to their successes as information and relationship brokers? Or, like Dorothy in the Land of Oz, are we being manipulated by a man behind the curtain? There are biases that we have that we're unaware of, but that suffuse our interpretation of the everyday. Digital technologies are being generated from a with, within a miasma of cultural, temporal, material, psychological, environmental ingredients, which ultimately flavor the ultimate final product. 
For example, the computer desktop was designed from a Western point of view. Its layout and folders are designed to organize and help us work more effectively. But this paradigm has absolutely no relevance to the day-to-day -day experience of a banana farmer in Ghana. How can the designers of a technology not be influenced by their social cultural, socio-cultural backgrounds? The technological features of a system itself will flavor your digital pie. So while a printing press can't record or play audio without significant modification, the nuts and bolts of a digital system help to define what can and can't be done with that device. This can include the language, the logic, and even the capacity. And with these in mind, there's one more other element that I think gets to the bleeding heart of the issue. And this is a misunderstanding that misrepresents how we try to use the technology to mediate our social and our psychological worlds. How do you define being human? When we think about who we are, many different things come into play. Our psychological sense of self, our name on our bank cards, the username and an email address. Each of these in some way defines us. And this is the conundrum that's facing designers of web technologies. How can they translate all of this into software? And in fact, this is a classic case of namespace collision. Two things that look the same and sound the same, but in fact mean different things according to the discipline that you're in. Specifically, the part of being human that we feel psychologically is one kind of identity. The part of being human that a computer programmer can code is another. The pieces of us that can be imported into software are our digital identities. The data that acts as a unique reference to a specific object where that object can be a person, a thing, a concept, a group, or any other definable entity. Digital identity's main role is authentication, determining whether an entity is who or what he or she is believed to be and is worthy of trust. The online identity as well is, oh, Jesus, this is going quickly. <laughs> this is true of the online identity as well. However, with digital identity, authentication is binary. It's either entirely true or entirely false, and it always stays the same. Now, while digital identity answers the question, are we sure that X is Y, online identity continues the statement, I, Y, consists of A, B, and C. It's a set of unique characteristics that defines who the individual is, the expression of self that is mediated by the computer. It's constantly changing to suit the needs, the strategies, and the tactics of whatever situation that we're in. Online identity, identity in general, changes throughout our lifetimes and in different contexts. Who we are at home is different from who we are at work. But these nuances are really different to capture in ones and zeros. Designers of software necessarily work within very rigid parameters. Shades of gray and frequently fluctuating self-concepts don't translate very well. Regardless of who you feel you are, the digital identity defines who we are in cyberspace, and it's what makes up the human online. What goes into this human recipe is, of course, at the discretion of the designers and their biases about what it is that makes us us. Google. Google is a relevance machine. It delivers a thing that it believes matches what we want. It must strip out the many elements that can predict a result because of the shortcomings in the system in which the search engine itself is built. The resulting hierarchy of elements that are included must be adapted to a computerized environment built into software code. At the center of this is that Google is attempting to predict an attitude, and even psychologists, the people who are paid to do this, can't do that. We don't yet know all of the elements that are part of this process. It's also far too cumbersome to create a comprehensive system of everything that needs to be included. It's necessary for Google to make a judgment call about what is part of the complex algorithm that it uses to give us the stuff that we think we want. Each of these is a hallmark of the person who came up with it. At Google's algorithmic heart are judgments made by the designers who are guided by their successes in achieving a powerful position at the top of the market. The company has been wildly re rewarded for the following assumptions. Number one, usefulness can be predicted. Usefulness 
is a human property that can be mathematically derived. The belief is that the many ingredients that make up Google's algorithm need only to be arranged in a particular way for a searcher to find the outcome relevant and valuable. Number two, just enough to be magical. Google's search results appear to be relevant and valuable based on our specific needs, but in practice, Google's search offering is propelled by a magic machine that gives us the impression of delivering relevance and value. It doesn't offer what might have been if the searcher was to use, for example, another algorithm, nor does it say that the information it delivers is good enough, close enough, or here-ish, now-ish. Google presents the world of information according to it. This gives it a position of power in the searcher search engine relationship, just as the director of a film only allows the viewer to see what's happening within his or her mise-en-scene. The ingredients in the algorithm, therefore, don't need to be comprehensive. The results can be a trick of smoke and mirrors, like the technique used by fortune tellers, the Barnum effect, to give apparently tailored predictions based on observable generalizations. It doesn't matter if it's wrong will still believe it. Number three, all sources are created equal. The mathematical process that maps the information online assumes that all of the online sources of information are equal. It doesn't matter who the creator is or what technology was used to create it. Websites are simply points in the network. The algorithm creates the ranking. Number four, quantitative judgments are superior. The algorithm operates on these mathematical processes. Qualitative judgments about the relevance and the value for the individual searcher are not feasible when 5.1 trillion searches are made per day. Therefore, it operates on an idea that quantitative judgments are superior. Example two, Facebook. Social networks are platforms for self-expression, and Facebook includes features that, of course, let us express ourselves in lots of personalized ways. The profile page, the news feed, blogs, photos, videos, these are the basic sharing tools. And people use these to tell their stories and to create their online identities. But there are three design limitations to how much you can actually express yourself on the social network. First, you have to be proficient enough in using the tools that it offers to be able to show your friends, with a capital F, who you are in the way you want to. Not everyone is a great writer, not everyone has a digital camera. The variation in people's ability to use the tools provided or access to them isn't considered in the social network's design. Second, you have to be able to define yourself by the categories that it offers in its profile builder. Technologist and philosopher Jaron Lanier criticizes this data reductionism. He doesn't believe that categories can accurately represent a person. In fact, this is calibrated for Facebook's needs. It uses these categories to form part of the digital identity that it sells to advertisers to fund its service. Facebook's design attempts to balance the elements of the online identity that you develop on their site into the record of your digital identity which they then use to authenticate you to the database and then, of course, to commercialize. Finally, you must use your real name, and this is Facebook's unique selling point. One of the secrets to its great popularity is that it was designed to be an identity authenticator. It's possible to assume, with near confidence, that the person on the other side of the screen is who she says she is. The self-expressive tools operate within boundaries that actually feed Facebook, and it's not possible to venture outside or to experiment with some anonymous identity play. In fact, having multiple identities is an example of a lack of integrity, said Mark Zuckerberg in David Kilpatrick's book, The Facebook Effect. Life is characterized by a series of commonly recognized beats punctuations that distinguish one stage from the next. Now, I'm talking here about coming-of-age rites, graduations, weddings, parenthood, that kind of thing. Those are beats that most everyone dances to, usually at recognized and occasionally drunken rituals. But beats can also be more personal experiences. First day at school, moving out of the house, learning to drive a car, getting your first job, making a massive mistake getting a divorce, getting out of prison, having a midlife crisis, moving away, moving to, experiencing a sexual or religious awakening. 
At each of these, the person who you feel you were before is not the person who you feel you are afterwards. You've shed the old skin and you've started anew, as fresh and crispy as the pastry of a Greg sausage roll. A beat is a socially accepted, commonly understood life change in which you're allowed to relegate what happened then to then and what's coming next to now. You're not deleting your past by moving on. That would be pointless. Not only would the past in pretty much every case bar a few extraordinary ones come back to haunt you, but you might want to revisit it like a psychological barometer to measure against who you are now and hopefully how far you've come. Or perhaps to reconnect with who you've been and why that explains where you're headed. Laughing with your aunt, for example, at Uncle Vinny posing for the camera on a family holiday, eating a particular dish, listening to an old album, cringing at the contents of a teenage diary, even having a low commitment coffee with a person you've not seen in a while are all parts of you that you can visit even if you don't ever want to live there again. Okay, so how often are those artifacts of your past used against you? How often are they applied to the person you are now by the people who were then without any reference to the beat when they happened? Apart, of course, from ceremonies in which it's expected to throw back for the sake of throwing forward, like a wedding, for example. The actions that are clearly from the past beats very rarely are taken so out of context that people think that you are now what you were then. Because there can be a lot of discomfort, a lot of dissonance by being, conf by being confronted by the things that you did when you didn't know any better. So why should it be different online? Well because the web never forgets. When you search for someone, whether it's for a date or a job interview or just because you're curious, what comes back is one set of search results. In one set of search results is their whole life story with actions from all of their beats all jumbled up in a single mass. Everything from the stupid things that you did as a kid that naturally belonged to the childhood beat to the stupid things we do as grown-ups is presented as if it happened now, as if we haven't progressed, as if we've not been rehabilitated, as if we haven't learned from our mistakes. And learning from our mistakes is what personal progress and the psychological ideal of self-actualization, or being all that you could be, are actually all about. The web allows no concession for how we evolve socially or psychologically throughout our lifetimes, because it can't. It doesn't have the ability to make that judgment. So depending on how much information is online about you, you are at once an infant, a toddler, a school kid, teenager, a young adult, married with kids, an OAP, and possibly dead, which is of course impossible and inhuman. But then it is, again, it is a machine. It doesn't care if your college age silliness ends up in a recruiter's in tray a decade later. All technology can do is collect the bits of us and make connections that may or indeed may not be there. How does slapping an algorithm onto a social human issue solve the underlying problem? Yes, this is the proposal. The, yes, this, this is the proposal under the hammer inside some of the world's largest web companies. For example, Google's chairman Eric Schmidt has said, not for the first time, that the internet needs a delete button. Others think that information should have a sell-by date and fade over time. Perhaps we should remind ourselves at this point that the technology serves to connect humans to humans and humans to human-generated information. Why are we looking for a digital solution to this inherently social problem? We, not the machines, have the ability to discern between a person's life beats. This is a very subtle, contextual, social, and human phenomenon, and it shouldn't be delegated yet to a computer brain. We can recognize that who someone was may not be who she is, and take that into consideration when we're considering a job applicant, or a potential lover, or a collaborator. Here's the problem. We are part of the problem. We look to the technology to meet our needs. We listen to it willingly. We also believe it's possible to deliver the answers from a machine. It's sufficiently advanced, as sci-fi author Arthur C. Clarke wrote, now it is now indistinguishable from magic. And in fact, the technology is a mathematical system optimized not to break. The wizard predicts what we want within a numeric environment in which operational stability is key. Of course it's not flexible. It's not flexible at all. 
Educators are on the front line of web consumption, and they have lots of practice in thinking critically about what they bring into the classroom. Web services, of course, should be no exception. So firstly, don't assume that your students have any specialist knowledge. Digital native requires digital literacy as much as you do, and in many ways, more. That categorization is based on fearlessness around technology rather than any actual fluency. Number two, don't put your kids into technological systems that you don't understand just because it's popular and everybody's using it. Think carefully about the underlying social assumptions that are in the software. What are its economic principles? What is its political agenda? How does it interpret social boundaries? Consider what its presence in the classroom says to learners about what should be valued. Recommendation number three. Be aware of the critical differences between real world, online, and digital identities, both in their technical and their social constructions. All people are made of multiple fluid identities, and these shouldn't be confused. Indeed, encourage the use of multiple identities as a way to empower your students in their psychosocial development. Number four, consider that there are two forms of digital education the temporarily relevant skills around a specific application, and the permanent life skill of critically assessing the assumptions made by a piece of software. Now, everyone who goes online is a consumer of web technology, and therefore, these suggestions are also relevant. Number one, be aware that software developers don't necessarily have your individual well-being as their priority. Number two, Demand more from developers. You are their customer. And if your interests and needs aren't being met, don't adapt yourself to the system. Expect it to adapt to you. Number three, consider how well you're able to express yourself in software and whether this is adequate. Assess if what you want and need changes in the future, that the software is flexible and responsive enough to allow you to change. Consider the implications of your interactions within the service should that service change its conditions of use. Number four, in all of your interactions with technology, consider the assumptions and the biases that are held by the developers. Newspapers and other media outlets are recognizably liberal or conservative, but the promulgation of political opinions was not the point of most publications in the first place. Newspapers were originally established to sell advertising. Certainly, they expressed political affiliations of their proprietors and their editors and their journalists, whether they intended to or not, but over the 200 plus years that they've been the mouthpieces of news, we have become media literate, developing a language to talk about and to decode the biases that are within the mainstream media. It's only now that there are discussions that are taking place about regulation of information of freedom of the press and at the national and the international levels. We cannot see the biases in web technologies because search engines and social networks don't express their agendas through the ways that we're familiar with offline selective access, selective interviewees, the size of headlines, linguistics, or typography. Software, software's agenda expresses itself through other as yet unknown things. The agendas that are hidden within the computer software operate behind the screens. They're inside the algorithms that make computer systems operate and as proprietary content, they're kept invisible. In 2012, Rebecca McKinnon wrote that she believes that we understand how power works offline, but we don't yet understand how it works online. Despite this, we're letting the technology guide us through search or social manipulation towards what is relevant and what is valuable in their world of information. Melvin Kranzberg believed that the people who were ushering in social change were not the politicians or the lobbyists, they were not the revolutionaries or the ideologues. Engineers were responsible for changing the world. In 1968, he described them as greater social, revolutionary, greater social revolutionaries than many wide-eyed political radicals because without necessarily meaning to, they invent new products, processes, 
systems, devices that, that produce profound socio-cultural transformations. It seems to me that much social discomfort that occurs because of web services at a personal level comes from misunderstanding the differences between the experience of being and the calculation of that being. Even amongst scientists, there can be interdisciplinary miscommunication in which one believes in the multiplicitous, prismatic, and ever-changing nature of the self, while the other believes in a fixed, measurable, singular vision of the self. The identity that web services refer to is almost universally the latter. The relationship between human and machine is complex. Unpredictable humans shape predictable technology, and predictable te technologies shape unpredictable human attitudes and behaviors. We're a complex network of incalculable and unmeasurable human and non-human elements that contribute to a singular, precise outcome. But it may not be predictable. We are imprecise creatures, and technological solutions are blunt instruments that try to meet our needs in as precise a way as possible. Solving the human puzzle, therefore, is subject to the biases that designers have about what is human. In order to fit us into the equation, they must naturally make assumptions about how human nature will respond to the specific objective of their system. In truth, there's only so much that technology can do right now, and so it's important to be critical when turning to technological solutions that we use right now to solve our problems. Chris is now going to give his, his view and his response to your, to your presentation. So this, this is strange, isn't it? I mean, actually, the, the mise-en-scene kind of model, which um, Alex um, evoked halfway through, is very much a condition, I think, that we're now experiencing, I think. And actually, having watched you, actually, having known you asynchronously through text and Twitter and the work you've done with the BBC, and then there was this shock this morning that, hey, no way. It's you, and you nod when I nod. That's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> and, and actually, I think that's what you set up for me in, in watching it, that there is this uh, uh, kind of temporal ubiquity that we're all now expected to carry with us all of the time, that we, we deal with a baggage of when I was four or when I was when I first on Facebook, and now I'm having to deal with you. And you're having to literally, even this conversation, situated conversation here, is, is constructed with a, a temporal ubiquity that I knew we had to do this. I had to watch you ahead of them so allow me to have this conversation with you in real time. It's extremely complicated. What I'm going to do, Alex, I'm going to jump to my response because I know we're compressed. But, see, Alex is very interesting. She, she, I'm a fine artist working in digital spaces and I'm not very good at the self stuff. I mean, I don't think fine art is supposed to be supposed to be, but it's implicit. So when we stand outside ourselves, it's actually quite hard because the ego then gets, oh, you know, totally complicated. But so what I, uh, 10 years ago, I made a model, actually, which you can see here, of um, my experiences within houses. Um, and I was doing some digital work at the time, particularly in the way that actually any idea of home had been destroyed by digital technology because there was no way of having a consensual home. Um, this is just before I'd had kids, and I'd found that and in retrospect, actually, months ago, it still worked. But what Alex has done is dismantled that and smashed it into small pieces. And I'm going to explain why, and then I'm going to ask Alex to help me reconcile what you've done to me. Um, so this, was, um, this isn't a house made of four rooms. You're actually looking at one room. Um, and the one room is a house with four people in it. And in each room, there are, that each model describes how that one living room is dealt with by its participants. So if I jump into... This particular room, it actually describes the living room being used by someone who works all the time. And they don't care about the television. It's not on. I mean, it might even be on in the background. People might be on the sofa, and you can see the sofa is shrunk over to on the other side. And the mantelpiece might be used because maybe the person's talking to people at the same time. On the other hand, the same room for another member of that family, the television is enormous. And you can tell it's 10 years old because 10 years ago you had TVs like that, <laughs> which were as broad as deep as they were wide. Um, but to everything else, the, 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 the table shrunk, and the mantelpiece is actually invisible. Um, other persons in the room are very interested in that as a talking space, so they use that room to, to reminisce, and the couch is the most important place to connect to members in that family. And television, work, not interesting. And perhaps someone else 
The room is... Ooh, it's, OK, so, so, so you get this very complex space where there is no consensual space anymore. There is no consensual time for this conference. If you look at the Twitter, some of you online watching this, listening, there is no consensual space. But what I was listening to Alex, and I was like listening to these beats, because these beats are where we resolve things, and they turn into patterns or behaviours. So some of the beats around that house, rather than looking at it as a, a model of a house, turn to be making tea. Or perhaps doing the washing up or filling up the, uh, the dishwasher. Now, previously, all of these things were... I was quite happy with these. That, OK, I'd reconciled it. I know that my son uses Minecraft on the big iMac in the study, and I'm trying to do something else in the background. I kind of reconciled this. But what's happened recently is that um, I'm working on a project where people have started to retrofit sensors in my house. Um, and it used to be the case that I didn't care when the door was shut in the bathroom. My seven-year-old daughter was, whatever she does in there, I used to know when she went for a wee, I'd get it all over me. Now I don't. And it's great. I don't have to worry about it. You just shut the door, it's got a lock in it, and she doesn't get locked in anymore, and she can handle it. Now what's happened is, a few weeks ago, James came round from University of Nottingham, and it's not a huge amount of sensors, but as part of the Internet of Things project, they started to attach stuff to my house. That's him strapping um, a collar to the main so that he can look at all of the, the kilowatt differences and find out what's running in the house all of the time. Um, he's got this uh, Raspberry Pi on my router and my Wi-Fi modem, so I now, uh, in recording everything, that there's also a feed from the um, electricity. He's put three of these solar-powered sensors which push data back. Um, humidity light, I think. I'm not sure. I signed this form. <laughs> and he said it would be fine. <laughs> and then when I go in the toilet now, this is the one that most disturbs Mary, my daughter. There's a PIR sensor telling us when we're in the loo, and it, um, it measures light and humidity, and um, it flashes red, and you kind of feel comforted. Hey, it's seen me. And then you think, oh, it's seen me. <laughs> and then, and, and then I've got these digital scales, and um, so. I'm, so I'm now going to return to Alex because I, I thought that actually the model was quite good it, it separated out some of these relationships and now I'm in a condition where I'm literally going home tonight with a highly disrupted <coughs> domestic context where data's streaming all the time I, my daughter's worried and she said is daddy is, is, can the camera see me uh, you're nodding Yeah, and I, I thought no it's not a camera like you think but then I'm not sure what Mary thinks or what I know a camera is, because, of course, it is seeing me. What, what am I to do? And this, this maison-scene has blown out now. Well, first of all, um, you did it to yourself. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm so sorry. Fair dues. <laughs> but, I mean, it, it, I'm actually fascinated by this project and so much of the work that you do, Chris, simply because the way that you um, reincorporate life into non-physical objects, I think, is, is a really interesting way for us to reflect back upon how we interact with the world. It's part, in many ways, of the quantified self movement and, and how we are um, seeking in some ways. I'm not going to say it's actually an effective method, but certainly seeking in some ways to, to make sense of ourselves by self-reflection, by reflexivity, and primarily by data. That in and of itself has, has huge issues um, associated with all kinds of things, including you know, surveillance, surveillance at that end, but also at the, the validity of the data that it is that you are collecting about yourself. So I'd actually turn around and ask you back, while this is a really interesting project, um, and I'm, you know, I'm fascinated to see the blueprints and find out, you know, where you put all the sensors, so I could probably do it in my house as well, <laughs> where I have Wi-Fi connected, um, light bulbs, and, and all kinds of things. But I'm curious as to why you have chosen to put all of these sensors around to create a smart home, and then to reflect back upon yourself. What is, what is the purpose? What's the function of doing this? The, um, so it's quite interesting. So, so there's a, there's a, it's a part of an EPSRC project dealing with markets, new economic models for a digital economy. So um, Warwick um, uh, Manufacturing Group led this inquiry. And the question was that I think what you're opening up with your beats is that you begin to get contextual archetypes. 
So actually, in the Internet of Things, it's a very crude term now. It's actually inappropriate because it, it confuses a number of things. But in the context of things, and I found a prop, um, that some of the, the stakeholders in Internet of Things tend to think that that is the thing, that it's a coffee cup or it's a Starbucks cup. When actually, if we go for a coffee, Alex, it, the, the thing is going for a coffee, and it's the context in which you do those things. So rather like your beats, it's not about... Um, the marriage certificate, it's not about uh, the wedding photos, it's about getting married, and you can't narrow that down to one thing. Um, so that therefore, Internet of Things might not be just about the objects being cabled, and then not just about the data that streams back. It's about the interaction of a series of things that cons in which making cups of tea, or having a shower, um, are then constituted. And then, at the moment, if I buy coffee in my house, I buy it vertically, and I go and get some coffee. And then I'll go to the, the milk aisle and get some milk. And on another day, I might catch up with some sugar. So the aspiration of the project was to, hey, hang on. If things are contextual, like your, your, your beats, then maybe we need to look at correlated data rather than looking at just what the coffee is doing, but what actually is going on at the same time. So that, that was the context. I mean, what's... And, what? Remember several years ago, I was, I was introduced to this idea of Internet of Things, and frankly, it went right over my head. Um, <laughs> I, I was hanging out with people who were incredibly forward-looking. Um, you know, they were talking about putting RFID chips on the pint. We happened to be in a pub, so that was the context. And it was a social gathering, so we weren't there to exchange information you know, in a kind of formal way. So there you go, there's the context. But they were talking about putting a chip on or an RFID or whatever it was onto your pint so that it could then tell when you got to a certain level that you know that your pint was was almost empty and therefore alert the chip that's on the um, that's on the, the, the pole the pint pole um, that somebody over there could drink. You know this this is you know internet yeah. search stuff. This is connected fridge stuff obviously. So that's that's a particular thing. But I remember thinking that but that doesn't actually answer all of the, the questions that are involved in the going to the pub. Why would I want that in my world? And actually, I'm still not, I'm still not fully convinced that um, these additional sensors are um, valuable and relevant to my life. I can't say that about anybody else, but to my life and where I'm at in a particular point in time. Except, of course, that as I referenced in, in the talk, that quite embarrassing um, diary that I found. I mean, it was, it was so <laughs> embarrassing. I literally, I, I was like, I was curled up in a fetal position on my sofa when I was reading it, just going, if I die and anybody finds this, like, they are going to have such the wrong <laughs> about who I am and who I was. You know, so in that way, they're, they're useful as, as, as buckets or bins in order yeah. to capture self-referential material so that you can, as I say, see where you have moved on. But at present, I don't really see the function of or the use of such sensors as you have in your house unless they have you know, some kind of purpose for your getting feedback about how much water you use or, or any of that kind of thing. So while, while we embrace and, in fact, sprint towards new technologies, I think it's always, always, always very important to take a step back and say, okay, before I slap this in there, what are the politics that are involved, and what actually is it that I'm trying to that I'm trying to get out of it? You know, yeah. what what is the function? And so I, I'd be curious as as even more to find not just in addition to how it's part of a project that you that you're working on, but the, the value that you are finding out of these out of these things that perhaps you wouldn't necessarily have expected, um, and then the value that you're finding that you did expect. Yeah, I, I think I think. I, I'm interested in that, in that disruption because it is highly disruptive and we, you know I had to talk through with my partner and the kids and they have to know I mean one's seven there's ten and the Steph is 39 so we try and do this with kind of some level of kind of consent but it's very very disruptive I think what I'm listening to you again I think um, again I'm still curious about these beat things is that I'm beginning to realize that I, 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 did, I made this before I had, four, I had two kids before we had four of us in the house and then I began to realize I, I have been all of those people and I'm wondering now when the maison scene is that actually my, my daughter's going to have grown up with his dad now being the gamer when his dad should be the guy who's at the homework desk. And it, maybe there's this 
extend this problem of temporal ubiquity, what is it like to push into the future when I'm carrying my dad's past with me because he was seven once and I'm carrying my older brother who was also four once and that Mary who's seven has a very odd landscape and I'm not sure we do have any of the tools to actually manage this and we, leave, we, we talk about lead users in the context of disruption um, and that I, know that I suppose before we ask, the, I think we need to get the, the audience involved, but the last question to segue back to dis, disruption is, so you, in the talk toward the end, you set up this um, kind of a tension where you were almost talking to me as a father saying, look, beware of what you're letting your kids get involved in. And, but on the other hand, I want them to be lead users. And I know that I led in my household and I helped mum and dad get their iMac. So that I need my son and daughter to be lead users. If I don't ask Mary, if Mary hadn't asked, is it watching me? I would, probably wouldn't have evoked so many emotional concerns about this thing. So how do you reconcile lead user and also safety? Well, in some ways, I think it's about recognizing that people should be able to make mistakes. So, you know, part of it is allowing your daughter to ask those questions and to stumble and suddenly say, because then that opens up your eyes. But rather than focusing on that, that particular moment, recognize that as a need, as a kind of self-awareness, as, as, as your life, as it were, with the technologies, um, that aspect of your life is, is you know, the context of what's happening right now. But let her make those mistakes. And I think that that is the, the, the inability to make those mistakes is the thing that I'm that I'm playing around with at the minute, that I myself am learning about at the moment as well. Um, because it's always part of these conversations. It's always part of the human to human conversation. So allow them to be these users by all means. Let them run forward because they're going to find the holes and the broken bits and the edges and all of the things <laughs> that we want because you know we're, we're in our own trenches or yeah. whatever of our lives. But let them do that and then rather than rather than get in the way of that and say, right, I'm going to remember that now forever. Forever you are that person. You know, just let it. That's move great. On. I like so. I like that that opportunity for error, failure, and just, you know, that's, academia yes. needs to embrace that. 